Well, good evening. Welcome to Kings Park Baptist Church, our evening service live stream. This is a little bit of a different service tonight for us. This is the last Sunday night of the month, and so we're all kind of playing different roles tonight. Uh, instead of leading the singing, like he normally does, Brother Ben will be uh, the preacher this evening. And instead of being the head usher, like he normally does, my son David will be the song leader this evening. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty much just in the way, so I'm going to get out of the way and let us get on with the service tonight. Grab your song books, if you would, and join in as Davey comes and leads us in the singing tonight. Brother Dave. All right, let's all stand and turn to number 491, A Shelter in the Time of Storm. Number 491. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide. A shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever will be tied. A shelter in time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, rock divine, oh, refuge dear. A shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Thank you for your seeing, Pastor. <coughs> Let's open with a word of prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are, in fact, that rock, that shelter in the time of storm, the rock to which we can anchor our vessel. Lord, that rock that provides shade by day, protection and strength by night, that rock from which we gain sustenance, that rock which is our all. Father, I pray tonight that as your word is preached, that our hearts should be open to the leading of your Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, that as, as we go through this time in our country, these troubled times, help us, Father, to see that this is not taking you by surprise and that you are still our rock and our refuge and our strength. We pray your blessing tonight and all that is said and done, that it would glorify you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, let's take our hymn books for our last song this evening. Turn to number 264, He is Able to Deliver Thee. Number 264. Let's all stand as we sing all three verses of 264, He is Able to Deliver Thee. Tis the grandest theme through the ages wrong. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest theme that the world e'er sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Oh, I sin oppressed, go to him. Our God is able to deliver thee to the grandest theme, to the truth thou shun, to the grandest theme for a mortal strain. Tis the grandest theme to the world again. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able. 
Tidings roll to the guilty heart, to the sinful soul. Look to Christ, and faith He will make thee whole. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to Him for rest. Our Thank you for your seeing. Maybe seated. Pastor. Before Brother Ben comes tonight, I just want to remind everyone at home that uh, he will be preaching. And though he is a Bible college student, uh, he is still preaching the Word of God. And so we need to give him our attention. We need to honor and respect the time he has put into preparation. And so I hope and I pray that each of you will have your Bibles out, will join in uh, and participate in the service, and uh, be a blessing to Brother Ben as he preaches. If he says something that blesses you, that you agree with, go ahead and comment amen on the live stream if you want to. Let's keep the comments nice. But uh, if you want to comment amen or something like that, that would be great. But let's just uh, let's let the Lord speak to our hearts tonight. Uh, don't forget, coming up on Wednesday evening at 6.30 will be our midweek service, also live streamed. And uh, in, as I mentioned this morning, I want to mention again tonight, if there's anything that you need, any prayer requests that you have or uh, some counseling or anything, please feel free to contact us here uh, by email at kingsparkbaptistchurch at gmail.com. That's kingsparkbaptistchurch, all one word, lowercase letters, at gmail.com. Or you can contact us by message on Facebook Messenger, or you can call us at 405-691-2500. We want to be a blessing to you, and we hope that uh, during this time of trouble, during this time of uh, isolation, you will not feel isolated, because you'll know that the Lord is with you. And uh, we're praying for you, and uh, especially for our members. We love you, and we care about you, and we're praying for you. And uh, also for our members, remember, uh, we still need to be faithful in tithing and giving, not because we're worried about the church going under, but because God tells us to be faithful in tithing. And so we want to please the Lord. We want to honor him in all things. And so uh, if you have not tithed this week, and you're supposed to, feel free to mail it in or, or come by and drop it off. Or give me a call, make arrangements uh, to meet somebody here. But uh, go ahead and get the tithe in to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? All right, I think at this time we're ready. Uh, if Brother Ben is ready, we'll have him come. And we're pleased to have him as an intern here at Kings Park Baptist Church. The Lord just worked uh, to bring Brother Ben to our church uh, at exactly the right time, as God always does. So I'm excited to hear what he has for us tonight. Brother Ben. Thank you, Pastor. All right, amen. Well, I just want to say, first of all, I appreciate uh, Pastor Moore and giving me the opportunity to preach the word. I, I don't take that lightly. In fact, it's a blessing just to be here. And uh, I know many others, uh, if I was still at my former church, I know that we'd all be watching online. And just to be here is a blessing. So I appreciate that, Pastor, for letting me preach tonight. Again, it's an honor. And uh, even as I think about the circumstances here at Kings Park and many other places around the world, you know, we're all finding ourselves in the same situation, I think. You know, we're finding in our, ourselves in uh, what I've heard many pastors say, an unprecedented situation. You know, I think back to uh, 9-11. I was, I was in high school during 9-11, and I remember very distinctly watching the two towers uh, be crashed into by airplanes and come tumbling down, and I just thought to myself, time is going to be different. You know, the, the, the world is going to be a different place after this, and sure enough, the world was a different place. I remember flying places and realizing I could no longer go straight from the curb to my terminal. I had to go through security and long, long, and uh, longer and longer lines of security, and, and I just remember circumstances changing. And a, even as I think about today and, and our situation right now, it really is an unprecedented moment. Uh, our governor of Oklahoma, as well as our mayor, have both issued a shelter-in-place order, and uh, I believe the mayor in Tulsa has done the same, and, 
And this shelter-in-place order is something that we've seen many other states and cities uh, put in place as well. And again, I believe they have our best interests at heart. And even as Romans 13 says, we ought to obey the powers that be, and, and I respect that. And, um, and I just think this is just unprecedented, this, this moment that we find ourselves in. But I know that the one thing that doesn't change is God's word. I know the one thing that isn't unprecedented is that we can trust in God's word, that he doesn't change. Circumstances outside may change and our lives may change and, and uh, the culture around us may change, but God's word doesn't. So I, I just want to praise the Lord for that. And as I think about even what we're about to read today, I think that uh, we have a man uh, whose life changed for him uh, he found himself in similar circumstances that we find ourselves in today. And I think about his situation and the trials that he's gone through and the situation that he's in. And I want us to focus on that even today, even tonight, as we turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 24. So if you're able to and you can, I ask that even if you're watching through a live stream, you'd stand for the reading of God's Word as we turn to Acts chapter 24. And we're going to read verses 1 through 27, uh, verses 1 through 23 for context. And the focus for tonight's message will be on verses 24 through 27. All right. Well, if you've already had uh, the text turned to, I pray that you'd read along with us. And even if you're watching digitally, that you have a Bible out in front of you and that you would meditate on these words even as we read them. The Bible says, and after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. See how he's kind of piling it on here? Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency a few words. I hear this, this Tertullus is a, is a hired gun, so to speak. He's a lawyer for the high priest, and he's making the case for the high priest here before the, uh, the governor, Felix. It says here in verse 5, and here begins the accusations that they begin to pile up upon Paul. The apostle Paul is who we are talking about in this passage. He says, for we have found this man a pestilent fellow, a, a troublemaker. Can you imagine that, Paul? And a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, who also had gone about to profane the temple whom we took and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain Lysias came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee by examining of whom thy mayest take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. And as he finished, the Jews also agreed with him. It says here they assented, saying that these things were so. And you can imagine this pause here as, as the audience turns to Paul. And he says, after the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. So apparently Paul knew of this Felix. He says, because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship, and they neither bound, found me in the temple disputing with any man, uh, again he's disputing these accusations that they brought up to him earlier, uh, nor was I raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city. In fact, these are all baseless claims, Paul says. He says, neither can they prove these things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I, the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope towards God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense towards God and of man. Now after many days, or rather years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings, Whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult, who ought to have been heretofore thee, and sub, an object, rather, if they had ought against me. In other words, Paul's saying, if these Jews who had made these accus accusations would merely show up and, and speak for themselves, we could have a short order of this whole case. Paul continues, or else let these same hearsay, if they have found any evil doing in me, 
while I stood before the council, except it be for this one voice, this one thing he could be accused of. Though I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called into question by you this day. And Felix, when he heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, When Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. And here is our text, verse 24. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Interesting, as I read that, uh, this has nothing to do really with the case that Paul has been accused of. Paul was curious to hear about this testimony. Uh, Felix, rather, was, was curious to hear this testimony of Paul's. And as Paul reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way, for this time when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. See, he hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul. He hoped for a bribe, that he might loose him, whether he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. But after two years, Porcius Festus came unto Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. You know, considering our text and our present circumstances here in Oklahoma and many other places around the world, um, I, I meditated on it and I even meditated on the passage, but I'd like to give the message tonight a title, Fearless Faith While Sheltered in Place. Fearless Faith While Sheltered in Place. Let's go to word and prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you again for your word. God, I thank you for the confidence that you give us who are saved, God, who have called out to you for salvation, who trust in you and your word, and we uh, are looking to you even now for hope. We look to you for guidance, and we pray that you would help us even where we are at. Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight. Help me to deliver this message clearly, God, I pray, and we thank you, and we'll give you all the, all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So I know that's a lot of information. I know I read a long passage, but this is part of a larger unit of thought. If we go back to the book of Acts chapter 21, we see that a number of, of circumstances led to the situation that Paul has found himself in even tonight. Uh, there's a background here of, of his third missionary journey. See, Paul was on the tail end of his last missionary journey, and he had arrived in Jerusalem. Uh, the main reason that he had arrived here in Jerusalem was to bring the uh, gift that he had picked up from the saints at Macedonia and the saints at Achaia. Uh, again, they brought this gift to say thank you to the Jews at Jerusalem, the, the very first church, which was the church at Jerusalem, uh, because if it wasn't for them, uh, believers would not have been scattered throughout all the world. And this was a gift that he had brought. Um, and again, at the behest of James, Paul goes to the temple with four men, uh, to also preserve harmony amongst the brethren. There's a little dispute there, and without lack of time, I can't go into that right now. But Paul, uh, again, wanting to be all things to all people, decided to keep the peace and to do them a favor and uh, keep harmony. And so he found himself there in the temple in Jerusalem. Well, uh, not much time passed before the same Asian Jews that had witnessed Paul before uh, caught wind and saw him and said, isn't that the same Paul who we'd witnessed before? And and, and what is he doing? And they brought false accusation against him. And they moved the whole city in an uproar. And they were about to kill Paul. But if it had not been for the chief captain, Lysias, and Roman soldiers uh, rescuing Paul from this mob, uh, Paul would no doubt have been killed. Shortly thereafter, Paul, is, uh, he gives his testimony and talks about uh, his salvation and, and and he motions, even while he's being walked away or led away by the Roman soldiers, he says, wait a second, the same angry mob, I want to tell them about my God. I want to tell them about Jesus. And he spends that time to give them his testimony. I think if an angry mob was chasing after me, if, I, if somebody was trying to kill me, I would want to do everything in my power to get as far away from that mob as possible. But Paul didn't. Paul instead exercised fearless faith and gave his testimony unfortunately 21 verses later they say away with him 
similar to the way they tra- treated Jesus Christ, away with him. So these Roman soldiers led Paul away, and, and afterwards Paul had an occasion to, to talk to the uh, chief captain Lysias and also the Jewish Sanhedrin. Uh, likewise, they didn't like what Paul had to say. And a group of 40 Jews had bound themselves under a vow, uh, desiring to murder Paul. And so word got wind, or Paul got wind of that, and uh, thankfully was saved from that uh, assassination attempt. But because of this, uh, Paul was moved from where he was in Jerusalem to Caesarea. And during this time, uh, comes before uh, Felix. And Felix desires to have the, the, uh, the chief priest, uh, Ananias, and these Jews to come up to give an account. And so they do. And here we find ourselves in... Uh, chapter 24. Uh, So we're moving rather quickly, and I'm trying to be mindful of the time, but I'm trying to set the stage here for where we are in our text. So Paul appears before Felix for the first time. He's held for several days in Herod's judgment hall, and here in our text in verses 1 through 23, he appears before Felix a second time. And they bring three accusations against Felix. First for sedition, uh, which is uh, uh, basically a a troublemaker, a troubler of the peace, and they also bring an accusation of heresy, and uh, and lastly, uh, uh, um, sacrilege. They believe that Paul had brought a Gentile into the inner court of the temple, and therefore had wrought sacrilege, and and that, that crime alone was worthy of death, according to Jewish law. And notice, if you look through that passage that we just read, Paul systematically refutes every single one of these accusations. Felix placed Paul back in custody, but he gave him liberty during this time. Think about this. Paul has just emerged out of an assassination attempt uh, on multiple occasions. Paul has just emerged out of just a peaceful conclusion to his last missionary journey. He had been hoping for this all along to come back to Jerusalem, yet he'd been warned against coming back. Even the prophet Agabus had said, if you go up to Jerusalem, you will go up there and you will be bound. You will be held captive. And sure enough, he was. But he'd gone through all of these ordeals, all of these circumstances, and, and I think of any, even the most fearless Christian today would have buckled easily under these circumstances, but Paul didn't. In fact, Paul exercised true fearless faith. If we think about it today, how would we respond in, in such circumstances? We see that Paul responded Uh, while he was being sheltered in place with a fearless faith. In fact, it didn't just stop there by maintaining a good testimony before God and man, which we read in in chapter 24, but he preaches the gospel consistently. What's Paul's character amongst all of this? Well, he does everything he can to maintain his testimony. If we look here in in verse uh, 24 and 25, it says, And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and hurt him concerning the faith in Christ. You know, if I wasn't ready to give my testimony because of some reason, maybe I didn't read my Bible that day. Maybe I didn't go to the Lord in prayer that day. Maybe I was in a fight with a friend. Maybe, God forbid, I was in sin. I'd done something uh, sinful. I'd given in to lust, or I'd, uh, I'd lied, or uh, I was angry, and, and I allowed that anger to get the better of me. And, and God forbid that shortly after this, I hadn't really had a chance to repent. I hadn't really had a chance to get along with God and cultivate uh, maybe that, uh, that, that, that humble heart with God that I'm immediately called to now come before a king, a governor, a ruler, and proclaim Christ. Woe would be me to be caught unprepared. How many times, if those of you who are watching and those of you who are in our audience today, have you found yourself have you found yourself unprepared? I've lost count. I don't even have enough fingers and toes to count the number of times I found myself facing someone who's truly asked me a question about God and, and I thought to myself, uh, I'll get back to you. Uh, here's my phone number, uh, can we talk later? You know, I remember uh, I used to minister at Lexington Prison uh, while it was still open to volunteers. And a man, just as we were walking out of the prison, stopped me and said, Hey, you, you're a preacher, right? And I said, "Uh, yeah. And he said, I got a question for you. And he turns to the book of Matthew and and turns to a particular passage and asks me a question about that passage and says, I have a problem with this passage. Can you explain it? 
And I was really kind of having an off day that day. And I knew that we were already out of time, that you have to leave the prison by as a volunteer at a given time. And you don't really have a whole lot of, of freedom uh, once they want you out. And I knew that I didn't have the time to give him an answer. So I mumbled something quickly and I said, here's a track. I encourage you to call this number and I, I, I know that you'll get a good answer. But unfortunately, I just don't have one for you right now. You know, I regret that day. I regret that I wasn't ready. Maybe I could have done something better. Maybe I could have studied more that day. Maybe I could have prayed more that day. Uh, maybe I could have uh, done something differently that day. But I didn't. See, Paul was ready. His character was such that wherever he found himself and whatever situation he found himself, he said, I became all things to all men. In fact, one of my favorite verses is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. And it says, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached the gospel, I myself might be a castaway. See, Paul didn't want any circumstance in his life to impede the opportunity to deliver the gospel to someone else. Paul knew that he was a broken vessel, uh, meat for the master's use. And too many times I can think of where I wasn't ready. Too many times I can think of where uh, I had an opportunity and I forfeited that opportunity. How about you? Uh, have you found yourself in the same situation? Well, as we move on here to verse 25, we see that Paul had a message to give to Felix. See, it says there at the end of verse 24 that he he, that Felix heard Paul according to the faith that he had in Christ. I believe that that was Paul's opportunity to expound upon the, the salvation testimony that he had. I don't see here in the text that Paul gave his full gospel testimony before Felix. He had earlier to the Jews there in Jerusalem, but not here. And then it says here in verse 25, And as he reasoned, that's Paul, of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, look what happens. He trembled. See, Paul testified of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. A, a perfect three-point sermon outline, as, as some might say. And it says here, as we look at that first word, righteousness. See, true righteousness can only be found in God, who is holy. And I believe Paul said that. I believe Paul said that God is a holy and a perfect judge. And, and that true righteousness cannot be found in works. Uh, cannot be found in a title like, like Felix had or some lofty position. It couldn't be found in the abundance of wealth or possessions. See, unlike Felix, who was a sinful, corrupt, and unfair judge, God was a righteous judge. God could not turn away from sin, and he must judge it according to the standards set forth in his law, not man's law. See, Felix had kind of made a career of corrupting man's law. He was a Roman governor and no doubt by this time in his life had uh, swindled many and had corrupted many things and had done many corrupt, corruptible acts and had certainly uh, made himself a reputation because shortly in a, a couple of years he would be removed from office, no doubt for uh, some uh, crime or malfeasance. But I, a quote comes to mind and, and it reads like this. Back in 1973, one of the world's leading psychiatrists published a book titled, Whatever Became of Sin? And in this book, he showed, the author, that the very word sin had gradually dropped out of the common vocabulary of the day. It was said, we talk about mistakes and weaknesses, inherited tendencies, faults, and even errors, but we do not face up to the fact of sin. In fact, later on, he goes on to say that it's no longer even in our vocabulary. The, the notion of sin has somehow evaporated from society and is replaced instead by mistakes and weaknesses, missing the mark, uh, faults and errors and uh, some genetic uh, uh, issue. But see, Felix couldn't run away from that. He, he didn't have the same claim. Likewise, all men and women can't attain to God's standard of righteousness. See, he, Felix, and all stand guilty before God. They must be judged for their sin, and the payment for that is eternal punishment in hell. I believe Paul told him that. I believe Paul made it very clear about the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. We see in the Synoptic Gospels alone that, that Jesus mentions the word hell and talks about it more than any other place in the Bible. He talks about hell more than heaven, and I believe Paul talked about that. That's the bad news. 
But I don't think Paul left him there. I think Paul gave him the good news. I think he told him about God's love. I think he talked about God sacrificing his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, knowing that, that his blood shed paid the penalty for Felix's sin and paid the penalty for the sin of the human race. I believe Paul shared that good news with Felix. I believe that Paul pictured God's love in a way that Felix would understand, even in, in his corrupted, uh, uh, warped frame of reference, frame of view. Because in the Roman culture, love was, was I believe, a foreign concept. Uh, they, they reveled in lust. They reveled in their sin. Anyone who studies Roman history would know that especially those in leadership, and especially the relationship that Felix had. I, I don't know if he truly knew what love was, but I believe Paul shared the love of Jesus Christ and shared with him the gospel. See, because of Christ's sacrifice, God's righteousness could be credited to Felix's account. I believe it's because of God's righteousness that that same righteousness could be credited to our account. See, if Christ be not risen, then our faith is in vain. If you want to know a theme about the whole book of Acts, it's this one word, resurrection. See, it's because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that happened previously that we had a firestorm of faith. We had Christianity, which only existed amongst a few believers, just explode by the thousands in the book of Acts. And all of it centered around the resurrection of Jesus Christ, something that the world had never seen before, something that the world had no concept had ever existed before, would even be possible, but that was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And something I think about even in my own life, that as a lost person for 24 years, that's something I, I balked at. It. I laughed at that. I thought Christians were fools. We can't know who God is. We can't have a relationship with him. And no doubt Felix might have balked that before, but I believe that Paul really hammered the point home that Christ did rise up from the grave. We can have that righteousness credited to our account if we but put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ, if we repent from our sin and turn towards him in faith. I believe Paul told him that message too, that if Felix would just repent and turn towards Christ, he could have salvation. But then in the second point, and we'll see that here in verse 25, Paul testified of temperance. That word temperance means self-control. and In this case, it means mastering one's ability to resist temptations. Someone once said that man can control almost everything but himself. And I believe that that explained Felix to a T. He could control almost everything, being a governor of Judea, but himself. See a little bit of background on Felix and Drusilla. See, these were the two characters of Paul's audience, and yet they were prime illustrations of a lack of self-control. They lacked temperance. In fact, they were totally unable and unwilling to resist fleshy temptations. Why do I say that? Well, we'll see here that Felix was an unscrupulous government official who did not hesitate to lie or even murder so that he might get rid of his enemies and promote himself. He persisted in satisfying himself with pleasure so much that it drove him to steal away an already married woman to become his third wife. That's right, Drusilla was already married. She was already married to a king. See, she was foolish too. In her young age, she lacked the faithfulness to her husband, a king, being unwilling to divorce him, or being willing to divorce him, rather, to marry a crook. And even though she was a Jewess, her testimony implied that God's law didn't even exist. See, at least Felix had a good excuse. He was a Roman. He didn't owe any allegiance to the God of the Bible, to, to Jehovah God. But Drusilla was a, was a Jewess, according to the Bible. That's what it says. And if anyone should have known about the law, it should have been her. I wonder how many people in society today who claim to be Christian make that claim, are known to be Christian, yet their life is absent of the law of God, the grace of God. Woe is me if, if anyone sees me out in the world and, and God forbid, if, if instead of pointing people towards Christ, that my testimony instead points people away from Christ. See, while Paul lost his physical freedom, he was spiritually rich. 
While Felix and Drusilla reveled in their physical freedom, they were spiritually bankrupt. And now we come to our third point in Paul's sermon. He testified of the judgment to come. See, here's the clincher. Paul's bringing his message to a close, and he, he's already revealed about God's righteousness and how that God's righteousness is a high standard that no man can meet for good reason, because it, it's the law of God that points people towards Christ, according to Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. And I believe that Paul uh, clearly demonstrated that Felix was bankrupt, that Felix was unable to reach this high standard and needed, needed Christ. And then we talk about the temperance, the lack of self-control that they both have exhibited in their lives. See, Paul has to confront them with their sin. And now he's bringing it to a close here, talking about the judgment to come. See, Paul no doubt spoke of the impending judgment that would fall upon every person whose sins have not been forgiven. Uh, I don't know who the author of Hebrews is, but if in case it's Paul, I believe that even this verse was in his mind. Then it says in Hebrews 9, 27, As it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. And even earlier in the book of Acts, uh, the word says, Because he hath appointed a day, that's God, in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. There's a judgment coming. See, Felix the judge would face Christ, the true judge, at that future appointment if he chose to reject Christ the Savior before Paul at this divine appointment. See, Felix had a, a finite moment of opportunity here to confess Christ as his Savior. But if he didn't, he would face Christ the judge. See, when Christ came the first time, he came as a Savior. He came as a suffering servant. He came to redeem mankind uh, unto God. But... I'm sure for those of you that have read the word, have read the end, you already know what's going to happen. Christ, when he comes again the second time, will come as a judge. And it'll be too late. It'll be too late. See, in all these years, God has winked at or has overlooked Felix's ignorance of the law of, of God and, and his righteousness. And likewise, uh, God has winked at or has overlooked your ignorance for those of you who aren't saved the ignorance of your sin. But now God has commanded that you and I, all men everywhere, all women everywhere, to repent. God has now commanded Felix and all men to repent. I wonder, how will Felix respond to this message that he's heard from Paul? How will Drusilla respond to this message that they've heard from Paul? And I believe Paul being the eloquent preacher that he was and also being uh, versed in the law and just on fire for Jesus Christ communicated things in a way that they would understand perfectly. How would they respond? How will you respond today to the message that you're hearing tonight, Christian? How will you respond to the message that you're hearing tonight, lost person? See, the Bible says that Felix trembled. It literally says that if we look in the text here in the in the second part of verse 25, it says here, Felix trembled. This means that Felix was literally terrified. In that day and time, uh, Roman rulers were uh, able to maintain stoicism, a, 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 a straight face, so to speak, and, and weren't very showy about emotion, so to speak, as at least some commentators say. But, but here he was, all restraint had been, had been thrown off and and it was no match for the fear that made even his body to shake. Paul was literally trembling. His body was shaking before Paul. See, the Holy Spirit, through the preaching of Paul, convicted Felix of his sin. And by the way, that's the only thing that's ever going to happen uh, to any person as far as conviction. The Holy Spirit has to get a hold of you. It has to get a hold of me. It has to get a hold of every person to convict you of the sin that you have. There's nothing that I can do. I can't convince you of it. I can't throw every word of the Bible at you in hopes to convince you that you're a sinner. The Holy Spirit has to use the word preach to bring conviction to your heart. And I believe the Holy Spirit in this passage brought conviction to Felix. The Holy Spirit today, through the preaching of the Word of God, is what convicts you and I of our sin. But it also convicts us of our righteousness, or rather the righteousness of God and of the judgment to come. 
as Warren Worsby puts it, Paul had diagnosed the case and offered the remedy. It was up to Felix to accept. Well, how would Felix respond? Christian, what will you do with the preaching you've received? How will you respond? Those of you who are lost, I know you're hearing a message. If uh, maybe you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior and you're hearing all of this and you're wondering, what does this mean? What does this mean about me? What decision do I need to make? Well, we see, we see unfortunately, how Felix respond, uh, responded here. In, in the verse, it says that he trembled, and then shortly after, it says he answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, then I will call for thee. How did he respond? He procrastinated. Edward Young said, Procrastination is the thief of time. The story goes like this. The clock of life is wound but once, and no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop at late or early hour. Now is the time you own, live, work, and with a will. Place no faith in the morrow, for the clock may then be still. Felix replied to Paul by dismissing him, saying, When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Well, guess what? That convenient season is now. And that text that convenient season was at that moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. I know for a fact that nowhere in Paul's testimony, nowhere in Paul's preaching did he tell, Okay, Felix, I know this was convicting, and I know that this, this deserves a response, but, but you have another day. You have more time. It's okay. You don't have to respond right now. God never makes any such claim. God never makes any such promise to you or to me or to any of us here that we have another day. Proverbs 27 says, Boast not thyself of today, for, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. James chapter 4, and Christian, you know what this verse says. It says, For what is your life? It is even a vapor. It appeareth for a little time, and then it vanisheth away. Our life is so short. My pastor back home, David Garces in San Antonio, used to say that we're given that one bracket on the tombstone. That one little hyphen that's placed between one date and another date. And that's it. That's all we've got is that one little hyphen, that one little mark out of all eternity to make a choice. See, I believe that Felix had a reckless attitude towards Paul's preaching. He had a reckless attitude towards God's word. He didn't take it seriously enough. He didn't take it seriously enough. He had a reckless attitude towards his sin. He refused to repent of them, choosing instead to, rev to, to revel in his sin. He chose to continue the lifestyle that he had, and Drusilla, no doubt, continued to, to have the lifestyle that she had, and, and instead said, no... Another day I will hear of thee. Another day I will hear of thee. He had a reckless attitude towards God's grace. Think about it. The Bible doesn't say how old Felix was, but I imagine he's old enough. And all these years as a Roman citizen, as a Roman governor, worked himself up to this, this, this position. All this time, no doubt had participated in a war or had been in the midst of a war. No doubt his life might have, might have come close to danger on more than one occasion. And, and God in his, in his long suffering showed mercy to Felix by giving him the, the prince of preachers, the apostle Paul, to, to preach to him about righteousness and about temperance and about the judgment to come. And what does he do? What does he do? He's reckless about God's grace. He wouldn't surrender. He wouldn't bow the knee. How obstinate, how obdurate, how stubborn he was. Hasn't God been long-suffering with you and me? You know, I'm 35 years old. I'll be turning 36 in a couple of months. And I didn't get saved till I was 24. I think about all the things that I did as a lost person. I think about the seven years that my mom, uh, when she came to Christ, prayed for me. 
I think about those seven years she begged me to come to church and begged me to get saved. I think about all that time I wasted. I was a drunk. I had made a multiplicity of bad decisions. I had ruined my life. I'd ruined the lives of other people. Uh, I, was, I was a criminal. I did many things in my life that I'm not proud of as a lost person, even. I made a lot of mistakes. And for seven years, I, I heard the truth, and I balked at it. Like Felix, I said, another day, another convenient season, I'll hear the gospel again. Just not right now. Not right now. I want to do my own thing. I want to live life my way. I'm the captain of this ship. I think about all that time. And it wasn't until God took my mom to heaven. She literally died in my arms. And I realized... What have I done? I've lost the only thing that mattered to me. The only thing I loved. And now it's gone. I had sacrificed that time. But God in his mercy, God in his long-suffering grace, reached down to me one more time. And he reached down and said, Ben, I know you're at the lowest yet you can be. Because I've, I've brought you there. I've allowed you to come to this place because I want you to see that I love you so much. I love you so much. He loves you. For those of you who are watching this, God loves you so much. He is so long-suffering. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He loves you, believer. He loves you, lost person. If you're listening to the sound of my voice, for those of you that are here, He loves you so much. I count it a blessing for those that are here and those that are watching that have, got, have grown up in a Christian home that you have been preserved from so much heartache, from so much pain, from so much suffering, from so much sin and destruction and vileness and wickedness. This world is wicked. I have seen it through and through. I've been in it. I've been a part of it. And it is wicked. There is nothing, there is no pleasure that is worth it to sacrifice your life. Felix thought there was. Felix thought it was worth it. But he was rudely mistaken. If you don't know for sure where you're going when you die, I beg you, don't boast of tomorrow, for you have no idea what today may bring forth. I know as we look at this, the, the condition that we're in with the coronavirus and we look at the condition of our country, uh, supposedly the, the mightiest superpower in the world, and yet here we have been brought to our knees by a virus that isn't even as virulent as the common flu. Look how much our lives have changed in just a few weeks, in just a couple of months. Look how much our, our culture has changed. And even as I talk to people, uh, they have a reservation about them that wasn't there just a few short weeks ago. Look how much, how much time can change and how much our world can change. This is something that's reached to every corner of the world. Look how quickly things can change. You don't have tomorrow. For over half a million people who've been infected by this virus, if I have my numbers correctly, their lives have changed. For those that have passed on, I bet you they did not know that that would be their last day. I beg you, don't boast of tomorrow. Christian, I beg you to redeem the time for the days are evil. You know, we're taking a class in, at Heartland uh, called Pastoral Leadership, and there's a whole chapter dedicated to time management. And it's, uh, I skipped right over it. And uh, uh, I'm guilty of procrastination on more than one front, and it's something that I am working on. But I would implore you, as God has already dealt with me through this message, not to wait. You have an occasion, even right now, where you're at, to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Redeem the time. Can you imagine that such a time as this, that the, the bars are closing, the clubs are closing, that the movie theaters are closing, that, that all these places that people would revel in sin and entertainment, amusing themselves to death, are now at home, are prime targets, are likely online and on the internet, ready to hear from you.
Not only did Felix procrastinate, he did, not, he did an about face and fell back into his old habits. Felix delays Paul's release, hoping to receive a bribe from him, <laughs> from Paul. Uh, and he's even willing to, to keep him in prison to avoid an, an accusation from the Jews. And, and, and all this, even through the testimony and the preaching of Paul, Felix continues to have him come over a period of two years and desires to have a, some money from Paul, hoping that maybe the church that he represents or that maybe some friends of his that no doubt have come over time to visit him would give him money. And see, even though Paul was still physically a prisoner, he was spiritually free. Felix, although physically free, left this divine appointment a spiritual prisoner of his own sin. See, Paul was not responsible for Felix's reaction. I know, I know, being Paul, he was heartbroken. But I want to encourage you, for, for those of you who are Christians, who are, have done their best to witness to people, and even today are trying to do their best, you're not responsible for the reaction of people. You're not. But you are responsible for doing something with the faith that you have been given. I want to encourage you that you can still have fearless faith while being sheltered in place. See, long ago, a man told a story about a meeting in hell. Satan called his four leading demons together and commanded them to think about a, a new lie that would trap more souls. I have it, says one demon. I'll go to earth and tell people but that there is no God. And Satan replies, it'll, it'll never work. People can look around them and see that there, is, that there is a God. And another demon says, I'll go and tell them that there is no heaven. Satan rejects that one too and says, everybody knows deep down inside that there is life after death and that they want to go to heaven. Well, let's tell them that there is no hell, says a third demon. Satan replies, no, a conscience tells them that their sins will be judged. And we need a better lie than that. Well, a fourth demon came up and spoke quietly. And he says, I think I've solved your problem. I'll go ahead and tell the earth and everyone in it that there is no hurry that there is no hurry lost you can have fearless faith by repenting of your sins and believing on the lord jesus christ tonight for those of you who are saved you can have fearless faith by telling others about the gospel now even tonight you know we can respond with the type of fearless faith that paul had by not letting the circumstances that surround us to take our eyes off Jesus Christ. See, this coronavirus pandemic being sheltered in place, the, the potential loss of jobs and income, I know things are hurting and, th and people are hurting and times are tough. There's lifestyle changes and many other things that I can say, but don't let these things take your eyes off Jesus Christ. Don't be distracted. These things should not deter our faith in Him. We can respond with a type of fearless faith that Paul had by testifying to others the gospel of Jesus Christ. How? I want to give you some practical uh, examples that in my own life and even just the people here at Kings Park have done over the last week. Just the other day I had to pick up a suit at the dry cleaners, which I was praising the Lord was still open. Thankfully they're considered an essential service. And I had an occasion to talk to a woman about Jesus Christ. I've chosen now that if I need to go to a gas station that I go inside to pay the clerk to, to get gas or maybe snacks and a drink. And guess what? They're still open. I went through a drive through recently uh, to get something to eat. And even just yesterday, I went to a coffee shop through the drive through and was able to give a lady a track and tell her about Jesus Christ. Recently, we were able to walk around the lake where there's a whole multitude of people. Yes, they're all practicing social distancing, but think about it. Be creative. There's people out there. I was even able to talk to customer service on the phone, and even in that opportunity could, could talk to someone about Jesus Christ. Christian, you have no doubt neighbors that are next to you and neighbors in your apartments. You have opportunity. The pastor here had an opportunity to involve himself in the lives of the people at our campus at Heartland. What a blessing that he was able to bring some food to the, to the students there that are no doubt are probably pulling out their hair and going crazy, going stir crazy, just want to get out of there. And for a moment, he was able to, to just break the dullness and give them something to eat. 
I think about even an occasion to reach out to your family members in this time. My grandmother, who uh, hopefully uh, may be watching tonight, uh, even had a, ch a chance to talk to her on the phone and just to tell her I love her and to let her know that things will be all right. You can respond to your circumstances while being sheltered in place by testifying to others the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, you too can have fearless faith while being sheltered in place. You can have fearless faith while being sheltered in place. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word. I thank you, Lord, for having mercy on me. I thank you, Lord, that even for all those that are, that are listening, that are watching, they can all say one thing. God has had mercy on them, has preserved them, has kept them alive. Every breath from you is a gift. I pray, Lord, for everyone who's watching, that they know you, that they can say, I have confessed my sin to Christ and I have received him as my Lord and Savior. And if they haven't, Lord, I pray that even now you would do a work in their hearts, convict them of their sin, Lord, and, and make it very simple, the plan of salvation. That if they just put their faith and trust in you, Lord, to, can, to, to forgive them of their sin, that today they can be saved. Lord, I pray that you would help us Christians to be an even stronger witness for you than we've ever been. That it won't be said about this time in history that we forfeited it, that we let it pass by. Help us, Lord God, to bring you honor and glory and praise. And it's in your Son's wonderful, beautiful name that I pray. Amen. As we close the service tonight, I want to give everybody an opportunity to respond to the message they just heard. Felix heard the message of the gospel, and he was afraid, and then responded wrongly by saying, I've got another day. But friend, we don't know that we have another day. The Bible says, boast not what shall be of tomorrow, for you don't know what a day we bring. Friend, don't assume that you're going to have tomorrow or another week or another month or another year to make a decision for Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask our piano player to play softly here in the background as I just go through very quickly the plan of salvation with each one. And, and it's, it just goes like this. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no one, no one, who is not a sinner. If you draw breath, if you have a pulse, you are a sinner. You're born that way because of the condemnation of sin and the curse of sin placed on Adam and on all mankind. But God in his infinite love and mercy provided the grace of his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross to pay for your sins. One man sinned, Adam, so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And then one, Jesus Christ, the son of God, without sin, died and suffered that separation from his father so that you and I could have everlasting life. It's God's perfect justice. One sinned, all were condemned. One died innocent, all were redeemed. But you have to accept his gift. And the way you do that is you confess that you're in need as a sinner. You tell God, I'm sorry that I'm a sinner. And I need salvation. And you put your faith in the blood of Christ as the only atonement for your sin. And friend, the Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, thou shalt be saved. You might be thinking, well, Pastor Moore, you don't know what I've done. I don't, but God does. And God says there's no sin that takes you beyond his reach. Maybe you're thinking, well, Pastor Moore, I've been a sinner for a long time. God knows that. But God is not slack concerning his promise. And he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So whatever you've done, wherever you've been, however long or far you've traveled away from the Lord Jesus Christ, friend, Tonight you've heard the gospel and you're responsible to accept his gift. I want you tonight 
receive Jesus Christ. If you are saved tonight, then the invitation to you is very simple. Are you ready, like the Apostle Paul, to use this opportunity to show fearless faith while sheltering in place? If not, if there's something in your life that's in the way, Christian friend, won't you, won't you put that aside? Leave it with the Lord Jesus and let him take it and wash you, make you clean, and use you for his work. Whatever area that God is working in you tonight, let him have his way. In just a moment, we're going to pray and we're going to be dismissed. But I want to extend this offer to you. If Tonight, if you, if you need to be saved and you want to talk to somebody, you can call the church. You can email us. You can send us a message on Facebook. We'll respond as instantly as we can. If you need to, some counseling, if there's anything in your life you want to talk about, just, just let us know. But don't think that you can take care of it in another season. Accept that faith in Christ today. Father, I pray you'd have your way in our hearts and lives. Lord, I pray that you would use your word to speak to the hearts of each one listening tonight and those that will hear this message throughout the week. May the unsaved come to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, may the saved be convicted and moved to be ready to preach. And Father, may you be glorified by what happens in us because of this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us once again. Please contact us if you need to pray, need a prayer request, if you want to talk to somebody. Our email is kingsparkbaptistchurch at gmail.com. You can send us a message on Facebook, or you can call us on the phone, 405-691-2500. Thank you. God bless you. You're dismissed.